the Auto Line Studios. Here is your host, John McElroy. I want to thank you all for joining us on AutoLine this week, where the discussion is going to be all about the Mexican automotive industry, which is off to the races right now. And I've got three experts to dive into the details of what's going on there, including Norm Jacobs, the president of San Luis Rossini International, a supplier company, Randy Miller, the global automotive leader for Ernst & Young, also known as EY these days, and John Martin, the senior vice president for manufacturing, purchasing, and supply chain management at Nissan Americas. And I want to thank the three of you for joining us today. Thanks for having us, John. John, let me start with you. What is going on in Mexico? Volkswagen, Nissan have been there forever, GM, Ford, and Chrysler. And now we're seeing a slew of other automakers jumping in. Audi, Kia, BMW, Honda, Mazda, Toyota. What is going on in Mexico? Why are so many go going in there? Great question, John. And thank you for inviting me on the show. We've been in Mexico since 1966. It was our first overseas factory that we established in Cuernavaca, just outside, outside of Mexico City. There are three key factors, as I see it, and indeed as Nissan sees it, which invite investment in that country. First of all, cost competitiveness. If we look at Mexico as it stands today, it's a much more competitive manufacturing base than China. If we look at productivity-adjusted wage growth in China over the last 10 years, plus 187%. If we look at the same factor for Mexico, 27%. So Mexico is eroding the competitiveness of China. That's clear. Second area of cost competitiveness, energy. As you know, energy costs in the United States, very competitive because of the surge in, in shale gas, shale oil. That's pegging the prices in Mexico. Great advantage for us, and it flows right through the supply chain. It's the very energy intensive products, plastic, steel, all to the benefit of automotive industry and general appliance manufacturing. The next area, it's connected. They have 44 free trade agreements, more than any other country in the world. Compare that to the United States, 20 free trade agreements. China, 18. It's connected. And the third area, a very, very, uh, if you will, business-friendly environment with relatively moderate wage growth, as I've talked about before, uh, friendly taxes and proximity to the United States. It's got everything going for it. Randy, you see it the same way? Uh, maybe a better place to be than China these days? Well, thanks, John. Um, and uh, I would agree. I think Mexico will continue to um, really move forward with great growth. Uh, it's a very important practice for us. We have a robust um, set of uh, practices down there. And I think you'll continue to see movement from other markets uh, into Mexico. Probably what I would add uh, on top of that is uh, a very... Uh, relatively stable government that continues to uh, provide additional incentives uh, to make the market very attractive, both from a production perspective and I think you're going to see continued growth from a pure market perspective as well. The middle class uh, growth down in Mexico is going to continue to grow very aggressively and I think from a market perspective itself, you'll see significant opportunity uh, moving there uh, as well. Norm, so tell us a little bit about your, your company, too, uh, San Luis Rossini, and, and why you're in Mexico and what your outlook is. Well, you know, John, very good. Uh, both John and Randy have done a good job to bring maybe the higher level of the uh, economics and the discussion of what's happening in Mexico. Uh, but for us, San Luis Rossini is a, uh, a manufacturer of suspension products and brake products, uh, predominantly serving the North American and South American market. Uh, we have manufacturing in uh, Flint, we have uh, manufacturing in Montpelier, Ohio, but we're predominantly in, in, in Brazil and in Mexico. And so we've been in the industry for 80 years. Um, but I think that uh, in, in the growth through the NAFTA process, one of the things that uh, we, San Luis or Sydney, I think brings to the, to the party is, is uh, along with the competitive cost, is the fact that uh, it's a very can-do attitude company. Uh, we have the market share we have because of our, our strength of technology. Uh, the strength in our quality, our strength in delivery. And I think that's one of the benefits that uh, people are going to see out of Mexico as they, as, as, as they uh, you know, supply the manufacturer in Mexico. And uh, many times uh, we bring a new customer in and it's, they're reluctant, they're wondering about you know, this, this uh, buying out of Mexico. But once they get to our facilities and they, they go through, they see that it's you know, a very world class. And that's really what I hear when they leave is you know, world class operation. So um, to me, I think there's a lot of that in Mexico. Uh, when you go into the assembly plants, uh, uh, it may seem like a low-cost uh, manufacturing company, but when you go into the facility, all of a sudden you open the doors and there it is. It's, it's, it's world-class. So, 
Now, here in the U.S., we hear so many negative stories about violence, narco-trafficking, you know, it, it, seemingly innocent people getting murdered. You know, I, I keep pointing out as somebody who's from Detroit, we should all take this maybe uh, with a little bit of perspective. But what do you all think? Is it safe to go down there and do business? John, let, let me start, if you don't mind, because, uh, you know, in, in 1997, 1998, uh, I lived in Piedras Negras, Mexico. And uh, I had no issues. I, you know, my family was there. You know, we would walk the streets. Uh, you know, violence safety was not a concern. But certainly over the past several years, uh, you know, security and, and safety has become an issue. But I really do believe that the, uh, you know, the leaders in Mexico have done a good job to, uh, uh, you know, put systems, enhance, uh, implement uh, the safety throughout the country. Uh, I know that at Rossini, we have uh, enhanced, uh, you know, security systems that, you know, protect, uh, make sure our, our people are safe, our customers are safe, and our facilities are safe. And as the uh, industry grows and these new facilities open, I'm certain that the uh, government of Mexico will put a high focus on, uh, you know, the security measures in the country as, as they've been trying to do. Mm -hmm. I guess what I would add uh, to that would be, I think we're seeing conditions improving uh, overall. I would echo that. I think there are a number of programs in place uh, being put together by local and uh, the national government that are that are making an impact. Uh, that doesn't mean that you don't need to have uh, the formal processes, protocols, and safety precautions that you would have in Mexico or any uh, market uh, that uh, has these things going on. But I, I would say we're not seeing uh, our expats pulling out of that market. We're continuing to see more movement in and, and good progress right now. Yeah, from the point of view of a, a very large manufacturing employer, we've got, we've got around 14,000 employees in Mexico, so we're very conscious of the security situation. And it's patchy. But for sure, I would agree with Norm, the situation has definitely improved. If you go back, I believe the high point in terms of violent crime was around 2010. Maybe it correlated with the, with the severe economic circumstances that existed in Mexico and the U.S. at the time. Because there's a clear correlation between poverty and violence. But we've definitely seen it improve. And for sure, we take it very, very seriously, still. So we've got very defined, we operate in, in over 72 countries in the world. So some of those countries are less or more safe than Mexico. But for sure, we take security very seriously, particularly of our employees. But just as Norm and Randy said, we've not seen any pressure from expat employees, Americans, Europeans, wanting to move out. They enjoy the lifestyle down there just too much. Hmm. Good to hear. Randy, what's your sense of how the Mexican market sales of cars and trucks are going right now? When I look at the numbers, uh, for the first half, they look a little bit weak. Looks like they may have been strengthening uh, a little bit more recently. What's your outlook for the Mexican market? Our outlook is is very positive. Uh, I think you are uh, uh, dead on that, that the last quarter was a little bit flat, uh, but uh, we would see very positive momentum going forward. I think uh, 2014, from a production perspective, I think we'll, we'll see probably 3.1 million uh, units. Uh, I think after that, uh, probably 3.5 million. And, and I continue uh, to be very, very optimistic that, that the market itself, uh, I would say Mexico will probably move from, let's say, number nine position to number eight position, perhaps even up to, to number seven position. In the world, you mean, of all countries that make um, vehicles. In, in terms of uh, yeah, production, so very optimistic in terms of uh, what I'm seeing. And I want to get in, into that production aspect, but John, Nissan sells cars. In fact, are, yep. Is it Nissan or Volkswagen that's number one? In no, we're the, we're the market leader. We've got about 26% market share. So just over one in every four cars sold in Mexico is a Nissan. That's something that we're very proud of. And we continue to grow there. And one of the things that we're pretty immune to, at that sort of market share, provided we keep on updating our product portfolio, which we are doing with the launch of the new pickup truck, which I know Norm is helping us do. He's a key supplier to that. We're launching a new pickup truck. We've got over 95% share on that pickup truck. But we're refreshing it. So the one thing that we see is that uh, there has been a slight slowdown in quarter one. We do see and we predict a pretty sustained recovery from that slowdown in quarters two to the quarters four. Hmm. So we're not worried about it at all. Okay, Norm, we, we got to get the supplier's perspective on this. How, how do you see the Mexican market? Well, you know, John, we see it strong. Um, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about uh, the growth in Mexico and as, as a supplier, we have a predominant uh, share in the leaf spring market, uh, not as predominant in the coal spring market. But as Mexico grows, one of the uh, uh, deals with that is, is, you know, become a global supplier. 
Uh, you know, uh, when you're a regional guy and if you don't have a global footprint, uh, that growth as, as that market grows, you know, can work against you. So, you know, one of the things that St. Louis Racini is looking at is, is how do we become a little more global, uh, you know, to prepare ourselves as, as that market grows. Trucks are going great in Mexico, and trucks predominantly use leaf springs, at least in the rear. That's got to be good for your business. Oh, for sure. Our, our, our business is uh, the highest. We made uh, record numbers in, in uh, Q3 2013. Uh, you know, we continue to make some of the uh, uh, best numbers we see uh, here in 2014. So. John, what's, what's keeping the market a little bit flat for the first half of the year? I mean, in the U.S., we're seeing great growth in new car sales, cars and trucks. Why not so in Mexico? Yeah, one of the issues that we saw in Mexico was jobs growth was pretty flat through the quarter. Um, we think that combined with some currency instability, particularly around the US dollar peso, because there have been some swings in the last three months, we think that overall economic activity was slightly depressed in the quarter. Consumer spending came out of a very strong December. And so we think the dip was just a natural adjustment uh, we certainly seeing, you know, our forward order is looking forward into our second quarter, which is the period July through to, to September. Very, very strong. So we don't see it lasting. And think, of course, uh, sorry, Randy, go ahead. Uh, what I was going to add is uh, I think what, uh, what we're also seeing is improvement in credit conditions. I think that's going to help uh, really continue to, to move that market forward. And Randy, you know, you were talking earlier about production and, you know, it's, sometimes you've got to watch both a little more differently than you do, say, looking at the U.S. market, where production pretty much tracks sales. But in Mexico, they produce far more vehicles than they sure. sell in the country, and it's become such an export hub. We talked about the free trade agreements. What did you say, 44 free trade agreements or something yep, like they that? They have 44 free trade agreements. 14 so, countries. Yeah, I mean, you seem to be saying Mexico is on a track to become... One of the, it, it already is a big producer, but you know, could it surpass something like Germany, for example, in the future here as a, as a vehicle producer? I, I think it will continue down the track of being a, a very significant uh, producer. I'm not sure it'll hit uh, uh, the level of a Germany, but perhaps uh, uh, there, there could be some countries like Brazil that, that could be at risk of being uh, passed up. Um, yeah, the current that forecast track. is that this year, if Mexico continues on its current path, it'll, it'll overtake Brazil and become the seventh largest. Of course, Brazil's pretty weak, too. And Brazil's very weak at the moment. They've had a collapse of the real versus the dollar. Um, so very, very significant issue in Brazil. Not helped by the fact that localization levels in Brazil are not too high. So they're importing a lot of parts. So once your local currency falls in strength against the primary exporting area, which is Mexico and the United States, for the components, they've got a problem. And that's what they're suffering at the moment. But uh, we do foresee that Mexico, I think all forecast is that Mexico, in terms of manufacturing, will overtake Brazil this year. Wow. I mean, with the investments that we see moving forward, Nissan, you've got the Hondas and the Audis and whatnot. I think they're projecting by 2020, what, 5 million vehicles will be produced in, in Mexico domestically. 5 million? 5 million. And obviously, uh, you know, we, we were talking a bit about the production in, in, in Mexico. Uh, you know, 80% of that is exported back into the U.S. So Mexico is very dependent on what's happening in the U.S. market. So as you see dips in the U.S. market, you know, you'll start to see those dips in, uh, in Mexico also. Yeah, I think it's interesting to compare and contrast. You know, the growth that Nissan's seen in Mexico hasn't been at the expense of our growth in, in the United States. And I think... Some people, and I'm not saying you have said it known, but some people are getting slightly worried about, does growth in Mexico beggar thy neighbor in terms of the United States? And we certainly haven't seen that. Let, let's compare. I've got 16,000 employees in the United States. I have three manufacturing facilities, one in Smyrna, Tennessee, one in Canton, Mississippi, and a one million engine factory in, in Deckard in Tennessee as well. So 16,000 employees. That employee number grew by 7,500 people over the last three years, all sustained by sales growth and production growth in the United States. We've launched five new vehicles in the last 18 months, the new Ultima, the new Pathfinder, the new Infiniti QX60 SUV, the new all-electric Leaf with a $1 billion lithium-ion battery plant um, to complement that. And finally, just last uh, in the dying months of last year, we introduced the new Rogue compact SUV, one of the biggest growing segments in the United States. That's going to continue because in the next 18 months, we're launching three new vehicles. We've got a new full-size pickup truck. We've got the new Murano, which is going to be built in Mississippi. That pickup truck I just mentioned will be built in Mississippi as well. And we're also going to introduce the new Maxima. 
which is a very storied and historic nameplate for Nissan, particularly here in the United States. So eight new models in the last two years. But what, if we look at those models and we compare them to the models we're building in Mexico, I think it tells the story. The cars most people are building in Mexico are the compact or subcompact cars, where labor costs, they're low margin, so labor costs play a large part in the variable manufacturing costs. Labor costs are important in those. The cars we're building in the United States are large, complex, where logistics costs and supplier capabilities and experience play a bigger part. So Mexico, I think, will continue to grow on the back of South American growth, for these compact and subcompact cars. And US manufacturers, if they're clever, and I think we are, we're growing on the back of the complex larger vehicles, where logistics costs are extremely important. And you need a very developed supplier base. The weakness for Mexico is going to be interesting. We're starting to see some skill shortages pop up, particularly in the engineering ranks. And we're also starting to see some critical supplier weaknesses, particularly in the area of steel and advanced electronics. And that's an area where United States manufacturers of those components, of that steel, they're poised to make some pretty big gains in the market too. So I see genuinely, I think we've got to make this clear to, to what is in many cases a very concerned American public. Does growth in Mexico mean a lack of growth in the United States industry? I don't see it. I think it's very symbiotic. I think it's mutually beneficial. Very interesting. Randy, you know, uh, the labor difference you can't ignore. Obviously, m my uh, research shows it's about $8 an hour in Mexico, all in, in the United States on average around $37. That, that, that's a big gap. And yet I hear good things about the Mexican workforce, both blue collar, pretty high quality, and an increasing technical capability on the part of engineering, even though, as John just mentioned, maybe there's a shortage. Do, do, do you see it that way? Uh, I see it that way. I think uh, clearly uh, one of the advantages early on was that, that labor uh, differential. But I think right now you're seeing a much more evolved uh, workforce, high quality workforce, uh, at, a, uh, at a reasonable cost that, that is fueling that. I think you'll, you'll see that continue. Uh, but we are also seeing some some gaps as well, not only in engineering, but perhaps uh, uh, in uh, in some of the financial functions, et cetera, talent sure. gaps uh, that need to be dealt with uh, out there. But I think that that cost differential really does challenge some of the Asian-based uh, uh, countries as well, and in terms of uh, continuing to to make Mexico a, a very very attractive place. You I know, know you get down to Mexico frequently enough. You're you're the head of advising these automotive companies. What are some of the things that you're really keying in on on what you tell them that Ernst and Young sees coming? Well, I think uh, we talked about the export nature of the market, and I think that will continue uh, to be a focus. But partly uh, why uh, we're so optimistic about that market uh, from a consumer perspective is the continued growth of uh, the middle class uh, in, in Mexico. Uh, I, I think uh, what you'll see by 2030 is a significant uh, increase in the percentage of, of middle class with the, uh, the ability to continue to buy the vehicles. So we're very optimistic from that market uh, in terms of selling products uh, in that market. Mm -hmm. That along with the improving credit and, and I think a, a supportive government uh, that continues to, to put some incentives down there, we're very optimistic again from a selling product into the market uh, on top of that. So that's what we're talking uh, a lot about with our clients. Norma, are you running into problems trying to get the talent that you need there, especially technical talent? You know, it was an issue at one time, and uh, I'll be interested to see what happens in central Mexico as these facilities open, because I do think that uh, they're going to battle for, for, for talent. I don't know if this location is going to steal from that location, but we went through that. We, we do go through that, quite frankly, in uh, our location along the border, which is in uh, uh, Coila, Mexico area, a uh, border to Eagle Pass, Texas. And, you know, a lot of the smaller shops, they try and take our engineers. And... Uh, but, uh, you know, one of the things that San Luis Rossini does well is, 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 you know, we talk about the compensation, but uh, we have a housing program, and we, you know, that, uh, that, our, that our people can live at. Um, you know, it extends to social events for the families, education for the family, medical for the family, a lot of things that, that, that the people value. And it really does allow us to, uh, you know, retain our people, uh, continued education. 
Uh, everybody wants to be educated. And, you know, we at the, our facility in Mexico have a lot of educated people. I started with the company in 1997, and I was impressed when uh, I interviewed with the engineering group how many people had masters or how many people were working on their masters. Sure. So, uh, yeah, um, you know, I, I think that our organization is, 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 is uh, protected with, with good talent, but we're always at risk with uh, those guys across the street trying to take them from us. So, John, Norm makes a great point. You're running into talent problems right now, and here come Audi, BMW, all the other ones that I mentioned. It's only going to get tougher. It is going to get tougher. And that, you know, again, it's competition. And we are well-placed. If you're the biggest player in the market, 26% share, you have the household name, um, we can attract graduates quite easily. What I am impressed with, the Mexican government recognizes this, this demand and supply shortfall. And so, for example, with our huge factory that we've got in Aguascalientes, where we have capacity for 700,000 units between two facilities we have there, we have worked with the local government in Aguascalientes, and we've put in place a training college, which gives us a stream of very highly educated uh, young people to contribute to our engineering and maintenance efforts, which are particularly important, uh, allying that with some of their national universities, we're seeing no real shortage for us. What I am worried about is less attractive employers who don't have the nameplate of Nissan struggle, and those employers are our suppliers. So when they suffer, I suffer. So it's an issue that we're in constant discussion, dialogue w with the government. But what I'm encouraged by is they're taking real concrete steps. Sure. And they're putting an awful lot of money and effort and thinking into technical education, not just university education, where the investment is extremely high and the lead time is quite long. They're putting a lot of work into two-year educational programs. And indeed, just before we came on, I was talking about the efforts by the state of Tennessee to do the same. And they've made technical college education for, for all young adults in, in the state of Tennessee free to help address that issue, which is a definite and a here-today issue for the United States, the lack of technically qualified. I've been to Aguas Calientes, I've been to Ford's Aramo CEO plant and, and some others too. And what's impressed me is the night schools. So sure. people literally come out of Absolutely. work, they, they go home, have dinner, and boom, they're in school. And to your point, John, technical things too. I've, uh, not just uh, teaching. Uh, the you three know. R's. You're talking about, they're learning about electronics, pneumatics, hydraulics. The issues that make for a good, sound, industrial labor base. And um, it, You've got, a, you've got a very enthusiastic government that recognizes the issue, and you've got an extremely enthusiastic population that knows, as you know, the early 20th century citizens of, of Detroit knew, that if you want to get your way out of poverty, you have to work your way out. Right. And that's what, America, that's what Mexicans are doing, and, and uh, it, it's great to see it. But Randy, you, you identified that maybe in uh, the financial IT sides, there's still some gaps there as well. Well, I, I think uh, as, uh, as the market continues to grow, uh, as uh, the investment levels continue to increase, cl clearly uh, th there are some shortages. And uh, I'm seeing, though, programs uh, that are being put in place uh, to, to address those. Uh, we've talked about some of the education programs. I know there's a kind of a four-pillar program that, uh, that has been put in place down there uh, um, by the, the government that includes targeting education in those kind of, I'll say, scarce resource uh, areas, increased investment in, uh, in, in infrastructure, increased investment in the, in the market itself. So uh, I think there'll be strides coming to, to close that and also uh, you know, opportunities for, uh, for providers uh, to, uh, to fill those gaps uh, as well. Addressing that issue, what can Mexico learn from the United States and what can the U.S. learn from Mexico? Well, I think, um, I mean, number one is uh, just continued focus to, to stay at it and uh, incentivize the, the sectors that are um, important. And I think uh, there's a, a big recognition that, that automotive is very important uh, to, to Mexico. And, and so I, I would say just staying laser focused around that and staying at it. And that's what I'm, I'm seeing a lot down there. So that's a big lesson learned for me is, is kind of a long term view on the sector. Yeah, uh, from the very top levels of government, they really recognize the, the benefits of having a, a proper automotive industry. Yeah. John, uh, you, you know, you, uh, I think uh, Norm mentioned 80% of exports going to the U.S. 
Does Nissan export outside of NAFTA from Mexico? Yeah, of course we do. We export from our Aguascalientes facility 67% uh, of its production, and also Cuernavaca. The average of the two plants is 67%. So that's, uh, you know, we're talking about 707,000 cars this year, 67% of that going mostly to the United States, you know, we're talking about in terms of exports. So we're shipping about 350,000 units into the United States and Canada. And then we're shipping about 100,000 units to uh, the European Union, Gulf Coast countries, the Middle East, Russia, um, all areas where Mexico has established free trade agreements. And where th our Mexican factories, the quality is indistinguishable from the quality coming out of our U.S. factories and our Japanese factories. That's a testament to the people, Cheers. to the government, and to the community in Mexico. They're doing a great job. But um, the other thing that's very interesting about trading with Mexico, perceived as a very neutral nation globally, which makes trade and the facilitation of free trade agreements very easy. You know, so they just seem to, as I said at the start, 44 free trade agreements. Compare and contrast, 20 in the, 20 in the U.S., 18 for China. Yeah, you know? no, th that's a great point. I know this has been a key why Audi, BMW, and the Absolutely. like have said they want to go to Mexico because they want to use those facilities as export, not just to the U.S., but all over the world. You know, and there was a recent report, and I do apologize here. And we're down and to the end, so we need a quick Yeah, um, by, by Boston Consulting Group, where they clearly identified the two winners in the global economy, two winners, neck and neck, United States and Mexico. Mm -hmm. Why? Competitive, productive-driven economies. Number two, a big energy cost advantage because of the shale gas revolution. Number three, you've got very moderate wage growth. And over the last 10 years, relatively stable exchange rates. With that, we're going to wrap it up. I want to thank all three of you for having been here today. Thank you for having me. Thank, thank you. you. I want to thank all of you for having tuned in.